should still be recording. Um, let's see, get started. I'm Dr. Sherman. This is uh, not Pick Hall 3 3010. This is English 3010. Britlet 1, or, or the beginning of the British literature to 1660 or something like that. Um, my office is Pick Hall 3. How many of you got the syllabus? Got the D2L print. Okay, then we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, pick all 352 around the corner, but you're not going to need it because I'm probably not going to have in person office hours because I cannot stand wearing a mask. And I get, as you're going to see, I'm going to have to pull it off a few times because I get hypoxic because of carbon dioxide buildup because I talk so much and so fast. Um, this is your required textbook, right? It's the Concise Edition, Volume A, third edition. If you have a second edition, that's probably fine. The only thing that will be different will be the page numbers for um, what we're doing, right? Uh, disclaimer, two most important things on that are right here. This syllabus is subject to revision and check D2L daily before class. If for some reason I need to cancel, because you need at nine, uh, I'll send an email by seven o'clock or, or post an announcement on D2L. Um, subject to revision simply means if we get behind, things will get dropped. And I don't think I've had a semester in probably close to, this is my 29th year, probably 25 years when I haven't gotten behind in one class or another. So the, uh, Odds of that happening are pretty good. Let me uh, make this a little bigger. Uh, students with disabilities, you know who you are. I probably <coughs> have already received, I know I did for one student, um, the appropriate documentation and such. Attendance in mass. This is new for this, for this semester. This is the first time I've taught in person since March of 2020. Um, and because we've gone back to masks uh, in the fall, you know, which we didn't have over summer, um, and MTSU has an amended required, not amended required, has an amended attendance policy, I have amended mine, okay? So I do want to um, read over there. <clears throat> we won't have a mandatory attendance policy, essentially. Okay, so what does that mean practically? Come or don't come. It's entirely up to you. Okay, um, everything will be recorded. That's why I'm wearing not this. That's why I'm wearing this at nine ten automatically, wherever I am. If I'm wearing this thing still, like if I step out to use the restroom, it records it. If if it's after 9.10, up until 10.05, it records everything, right? If you come up to me at the end of class and I stop class a few minutes early, and you've got something personal you want to say to me, remind me to take this off. Because if you're right here, it'll record it, okay? Um, so whether you physically come to class or not, it's entirely up to you. I'll do what I've been doing for several years uh, now. I will record. That's what this computer is for. Um, it's recording, and that will get uploaded to my YouTube channel. I will post the link to the playlist for this class, and you can watch stuff there. Or that camera with this mic will record and upload to the videos tab of the D2L page for this class. And it does that. I've been told, well, I've been told various things. Some people say it takes up to a couple hours. And I had a colleague either early this morning or late last night say it is almost like streaming. Like it starts fairly soon after the recording begins. I have no idea which of those is true. Okay. Um, If you're not in class, you can watch the lectures on your own. I, I'm not going to Zoom the class. There's no reason to. Um, 
So <coughs> scratch all that. Whichever, that is, whether you are physically here or virtually here via the online stuff, you're still accountable, responsible for everything that's discussed in class. Okay? So all the lecture material, announcements, all that kind of stuff, because they, they'll all be um, recorded. And quite a few announcements, I'll also post the D12 announcement as long as I remember to. Okay? Um, read that on your own. <coughs> How about the masking? And I'll, I'll warn you right now, if if, uh, if you're very concerned about uh, COVID and you're afraid, you know, I might be spreading it to you. You might not want to sit in the front row because I'm going to have to do this a lot because I get to the point where I nearly pass out because uh, I talk nonstop. And I won't be able to wear these if I do another three-hour night class because I don't take a break in a three-hour night class as well. And one day you're going to see me do this. I can guarantee it. Um, read all this over and let me add a couple things. I think I might have it. Yeah, there it is. If you have an ongoing family situation, emergency, you know, situation, or roommate, dorm mate, best friend kind of thing, if something happens, let's say, in the course of the semester. And it's enough to really knock you off your game, so to speak. Let me know within 24 hours, okay? Uh, I will bend over backwards to help you finish this course. I, I will move deadlines, all that kind of stuff. But I have to know pretty immediately when it happens. If you have a, a loved one who gets diagnosed with COVID and goes into the hospital, like this week, okay? You need to let me know now when it happens. I mean, get them to the hospital, do all the emergency, emergency stuff, but within 24 hours. <clears throat> because God forbid, if that happens and that individual dies, and you don't tell me for four weeks, and you're nowhere to be found, and you're not taking quizzes. I'm sorry, but that's too late. Okay. Um, and I've literally had situations akin to that just about every semester for the past four or five years. You know, a student comes into class, is sitting there, gets a text, you know, a parent died. <laughs> had another student walk in five minutes after her dad died. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing here, you know? Got her out and stuff. People diagnosed. I can't. I mean, pretty much name the bad crap that can happen, and it happens. Okay, let me know. And again, I'll do whatever I can. Right? Um, it's only when I don't know that I can't help you. Okay. Um, similar. If you're a first responder of some kind, EMT, fire police, etc. Uh, let me know. In all those situations, the family emergency kind of one, I'll just say, keep your phone out, keep it on vibrate, just as long as it doesn't ring. If it vibrates, look at it, or if you get a text, and you need to get up and leave. If I know, no questions asked, okay? But also, no attendance policy, you don't have to physically be here, okay? You, you won't, you're not physically here, you don't benefit from any give and take. That's the, the big draw. Um, what else? You can use your laptop, phone, tablet, blah, blah, blah for electronic group. Yeah, I don't think this is available electronically. All the things we read in here, you can find on the internet. Um, classroom decorum. You can read all that on your own. The only two things that I would really emphasize, eh, I should, shouldn't say two, uh, if you have to eat something in class, do so silently. I mean, I've literally had students come in with like extra big bags of like extra purple crunchy Doritos and they're sitting next to somebody and that other person's you know, twitching because it's bothering them so much. So don't do that. Don't come to sleep, don't come to class and sleep. 
because you can do that at home and then watch the lecture later. Because if you do, I'll come up and do this. Especially with your heads on the table. It pretty much stops them from doing that. Um, I've only done that a couple of times, but it does work. Um, yeah, don't sit there with a biology textbook open in front of you or chemistry, both examples I've had, and work on other classes in here. It's just rude. Just, just leave. Um, similarly with this. I've literally been in this classroom and have had students sitting in that far back corner back when there was a row of desks behind that back row. And I could hear the music he was listening to. And I'd say, I can't even remember his name, you know, take him off. What? Couldn't hear me. Um, don't do that. I'll tell you if you're in as you walk in, take him out. Um, come prepared to participate. Come Having read the material that's assigned, if you have questions, write them down so you don't forget them. Um, I do lecture. I think it's a very valid way of teaching and learning. I love discussion, but like I told my first class, I'm apparently such a poor teacher, I have not been able to elicit, to come up with the right kinds of questions to elicit a lot of good discussion, but please, if you disagree with you know my interpretation or something I've said, chime in. Okay? The only problem with that is this thing won't catch you. This might. This has for other classes at least. But this for some reason will not. Okay? <laughs> so if it's a question, I might have to repeat it. Okay? Problem with that is we have 55 minutes. I'm used to teaching this class on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. We have 85 minutes. So that's another reason why we may get behind very, very quickly. Um, don't worry about the being penalized and that kind of stuff. Just don't come like a, you know, and sit there with nothing in front of you, okay? Bring a book, bring something to take notes in. You should take notes. What else? Uh, this is new, for me at least. And it's entirely because of dropping the regular attendance policy. Normally, if, if my quizzes are done online, which they will be this semester, because we do only have 55 minutes each class period, and otherwise a quiz will take 10 minutes out of that, and opening five minutes BS, and it just eats away the time. Um, so we'll have quizzes online. Failure to commit or some, complete or submit three or more quizzes, you'll fail the course. I would expect at least one quiz a week, at least one quiz a week, okay? Um, and or failure to submit an exam. I've literally had students who've done all the quizzes, done the first two exams and thought, I've got an A in this course, I don't need to take the final. Uh, no, you do need to take the final. There's only been a couple of instances where I've instructed students different than that. And that is largely now, I'm not saying I'm doing that this semester. I'm just saying this has been done in the past. Graduating seniors who have an A all the way across the board in this class. I've said, you know, you've more than proven yourself. You've more than proven you know this material. Don't even bother with it. Um, but I've only done that a couple of times. So, grading. No makeup quizzes will be given. Okay, I will send out a sample quiz, or I'll, I'll post a sample quiz. Um, I gotta look one up. Probably tonight or tomorrow, okay? Just to give you an, an idea of what the quizzes will look like, the kinds of things. Some quizzes will be multiple choice, some will be true false, some will be fill in the blank. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out on D2L how to combine all those into one um, quiz. It'll usually be 10, to 15 questions at most. There might be one or two with 20 questions. There will often be extra credit, like at least five points. Some quizzes will have more than that, okay? And the exams usually have oh, minimum 30 points extra credit. So you do really well. I mean, you can you can totally rack up, you know, 
Well, and they all just get added together. It's not like one exam is worth more than another. Exams will be worth 100 points. Quizzes will be worth, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20. Everything gets added together and then divided by the total number of points possible. Right? And we can end up with more than one. So, so, oh, I, I didn't check to make sure this was right because I didn't have my book when I should be the same. Uh, that would be the right part I just said. I can't be quite sure. <coughs> Beat actually begins on 42. <coughs> oh, I know why I did that. Because I used to not require the opening of B. That's why I've got it, you know, 44 to uh, 57. Okay? So we'll do some background kind of stuff today. In a moment, I'll. I might pull up a, uh, another page, kind of a chronology with some dates and stuff, um, some of which I'll skip, some of it I won't. But this gives you a, a, an idea of where we're going, OK? Um, first couple of days on bead, who, if you don't have any idea who that is, that's fine. You will in a few minutes uh, or a few days. Story of Cadman, Cadman's Tim, that's also from bead. And then two days for the Wanderer, which is a 115 line poem of Old English, and then two days on the Seafarer, another Old English poem, two days of Dream of the Root, about 150 or so lines. And then notice it's like, what, eight? Yeah, eight days for Beowulf, okay? Um, I used to teach Beowulf at the graduate level. I taught old, graduate level Old English, and then the following semester was uh, Beowulf, where the students had to translate all 3,183 lines from Old English into modern English. Well, kind of modern English for some of them. Um, if we're not already behind by here, we'll probably be behind here. Uh, for the simple reason I love Beowulf, and there's an awful lot packed into that poem. And it is nothing like any of the films that have been made of it, which is really sad because it's like whoever the poet was who wrote that thing, it's like that individual had a camera in his mind. And he was like, you know, this would, this would be a really good scene right here. It, it's very cinematic in itself, right? It's also got a lot of narration, and that's one of the problems. Um, hopefully I've got it. No, I don't. I don't have it divided into manageable bytes at all. So we'll just see what happens. Um, so these are line numbers. Hopefully those are the correct page numbers. I'll double check today and probably send out a third revision of the syllabus. Um, so we finished the Old English. We do some Middle English stuff. Then we have fall break. Notice, you know, uh, midterm exam, midterm grade. Are due to be posted this day. Okay. Um, it seems early to me, but so the only thing you'll have to be graded on by that time are quizzes. Because right. the, the first exam will be the old English exam, and I don't I don't have I don't have the exams posted on here. All right, simply because things might get moved around. And I'll just be honest with you right now. I entirely expect us to go remote. I would be very surprised if we don't go remote within the next two to three weeks. Okay. Um, my daughter's an ICU nurse. She's been on a lot of media, uh, local ICU nurse. You know, and she sees the stuff that most of us don't see. A lot of people your age showing up in the hospital, right? Um, I think the more that happens, the more pressure it's going to be put on the administration to make us go remote or to offer that uh, length field, okay? So fall break, we finished the gown in the green night. Chaucer, 
And so the first exam really isn't until, wait, is that right? No, sorry, that's not right. I usually do an exam after the Old English material. So after Beowulf and before that Norman Conquest stuff. So it will be sometime right there around the uh, very beginning of October, assuming we stay somewhat on schedule. Then there will be an, an exam of the Middle English material sometime end of October. And you'll have several days to complete the exam. Um, the exam will be online. It'll be objective. Quizzes will be online. They'll be objective. Uh, and then we start the Renaissance and the, the final portion, final third of the class, essentially. Okay? Here's important dates there. Quizzes exam will be online, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, unless you have a special accommodation, and usually it's additional half time or double time. Um, exam, you'll have 60 to 90 minutes. And again, from when I post it to when it's due, you'll have minimum three days, maximum probably close to a week of when you can complete it, right? And I will send out reminders. And as we get closer and closer to the due date, I will send out more reminders. And I might get to the point where I will say, two of you have not taken this yet, okay? If you miss the deadline at that point, you're kind of screwed because I will send out an awful lot of reminders, right? And there are some exceptions, like if big storms roll through the area and there's a lot of power outages, you know, um, which has happened a lot. Paper assignments. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Uh, tentatives, right? Because it may change. 2,100 to 3,000 words, 7 to 10 full pages, not including which cited. Research scholarly paper, topic of your choosing, but I have to approve it, and I may, I haven't decided 100% yet, I may prohibit some topics <laughs> this semester, just because I'm tired of dealing with them. Um, we'll see. Uh, but if you, if you, you know, early on in the next three, four, five weeks, you find something that, man, you just really love, and you want to get a start on it, Run a topic by me. Um, Ninety, probably ninety-eight percent of the time, I say go with it. I can only literally. This is my twenty-ninth year here. I can only think of a handful of times I've told a student, "No, you can't write on that." And usually, it's because what you want to write is a dissertation that is, it requires a lot more than seven to ten pages. Or, and I wouldn't say this to their face. It's just a really stupid idea. It, you know, um, I had one student once who suggested Grindel was a dinosaur in, in the old English poem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm going, no, no, you can't do that because <laughs> there's no evidence. You know, whatever you write something on, you've got to have evidence. You've got to have something in the text that actually suggests that. Well, you could argue Grindel is a demon. He's called the demon several times. You can say Grendel is a fiend because he's called a fiend several times. You can say he's a miserable man because he's called a miserable man several times. But it never says he's a dinosaur or something even akin to it. Anyway, okay. So follow MLA guidelines. If you're not sure what those are, email. Anytime you have a question, okay. If you don't ask me in class or shortly before class or shortly after class, shoot me an email. Okay. Preferably use the D2L email, and if you don't know how to use that, you know I can show you. Um, I can't on this computer; it's not accepting my login information. I can't on mine, or if you've got, you can pull D2L on your phone and stuff. I can show you. Um, but I prefer the D2L email because it doesn't; it's it's solely for this class. It doesn't get clogged with all the junk I receive at the university. Um, Usually means administrative stuff that has no bearing on this. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything else. A little comment about what kinds of papers we see, what kinds of grades and such, and then what the first page of a paper should 
look like. Okay, any questions so far? Any concerns? I will say, you know, one thing, because I forgot to mention it, regarding masks, you are required. Secretary next door has them. I'm not the mask police. The university told us yesterday, you know, we can ask an individual to step outside, talk to them, et cetera, and remind them, okay, if there's masks, you can get them next door. Uh, if they're adamant about not doing it, call the, I'm not going to call the police. Sorry, I'm not the mask police. Okay. Um, not going to, and like I said, I'm going to have to take mine down a lot. So if you're concerned, kind of just stay back a little bit. Okay. So let me. That's not the right page. That's the right page. So, do I want to do this that way? No, I don't. Um, oh, bear with me one minute. Projector. Off. Lights. Lights are coming on. Most of the board. What on this board? I don't know. So, this course is covering the beginnings of English literature to the end of the Renaissance. All right? So, that's roughly um, 1500 to roughly 1700. Okay? In actuality, it's more like, from what we're covering, 600 to about 1650, right? But within that time frame, there are three periods. The Old English period, the Middle English period, and the Renaissance, or what's also called the Early Modern. Period. I prefer Renaissance, but that's just because I'm old-fashioned and I have traditions. Right? The Old English period goes from roughly 500 to 1100. The Middle English goes from roughly 1100 to. I'm going to give you a round number. 1500. Right. But I'm also going to put another date in there because it works also. And then the Renaissance, roughly 1500 to 1700. Okay. So obviously we're going to start with the earliest period first, the Old English period, and then after a few weeks we'll get into the Middle English and then the Early Modern. Okay. So. Do this for those or anybody who is not here. So let's start with the old English period. What was what is now called England, the United Kingdom, let's say, the island that contained it? Anybody know what that was called before it was called England? It's still in part of one of the names used for it. Britain, right. B R I T O N. Right? Or that's also the name of the people who lived there, the Britons. Right? <clears throat> Another name, an older one, was Celts. Right? Who lived there before the Celts? We don't really know. 
People who lived there before the Celts are the people who built things like Stone Age. So we know very, very little about them. The Celts moved in sometime probably 8th or 9th century BC. Okay. The height of the Celt. Kingdom's not the right word because they, they didn't have a single king. The, the height of the Celtic influence, let's say, was in the about the mid 8th century BC when you know there were Celts kind of controlling all the way from Holstead, Austria to Ireland. Okay, most of that area. You know, St. Paul wrote one of his letters to the Galatians. The Galatians, the G-A-L part, that's related to the Gaul, G-A-U-L. Anybody know what was Gaul? Has a different name now. France. Modern day France, right? And that Gaul in, in Galatians and G-A-U-L is related to the C-E-L of the Celts, right? So the Celts had a pretty big area that they could but, in 55 BC, anybody know what happened? No? I can hear a little bit later. Caesar. Julius Caesar invades Britain for a couple of reasons. Economic reasons. I mean, why else do you invade somebody? One, ten. Britain produced a lot of tin, okay? And two, English oak. Really good for making ship, okay? So he invades in, in, uh, I'm probably gonna get this date wrong. I'm not taught this course in a couple of years. Uh, and I don't work with notes usually. 44, I'm pretty sure it is, BC, Britain, Is annexed. It is made part of the Roman Empire. Right? So, beginning here, but even more so after this date, you start to see the influx, or you see the influx, of Latin speaking Roman soldiers okay, into Britain. So the language that is spoken before the Romans arrive is Celtic, okay? British, if you want. And there's two different kinds, and we won't go into that. Take the history of the English language. If I teach it, and we'll talk about it. Somebody else teaches it. I don't know if they do it or not. Um, so you've got Celtic being spoken, and then with the advent of Caesar and the Roman legions, we have Latin introduced, all right? So now you, you start to get a, a bit of a hodgepodge, a, a bit of a creole, a mix of these two, right? Romans start intermarrying with Brits, right? So you get this also Romano-British kind of culture. And you can go to all kinds of places today in, in modern day England and see the results of that culture. Go to the ancient city of Bath, for example, and see the Roman baths. Right? Pretty cool. Uh, you can walk in parts of London and you can walk on part of the original Watley Street, which was a, originally a Roman road. You can go outside London and you can walk on parts of the actual Roman road. They knew how to build roads better than modern day contractors do. Right? Because they, they're still there and they haven't been repaved ever yet. Um, going to jump up way up in terms of English history, okay, British history. So 44 BC, it's an X. 410 AD. Like I said, I'm jumping way up. In 410 AD, Roman legions leave. Why? Right now? 
with Rome in control. From the invasions of Visigoths or Ostrogoths. And it's in danger of being sacked. So they pull the legions out. And what does nature abhor? Any physics majors? No, you all don't know what I'm talking about. It's like this with the Lord of any course. Nature abhors a vacuum. Well, when those Roman legions leave, there's a power vacuum. Because they're the ones keeping everything cool. Parallels, modern history, right now. Right? They leave, and what does that mean? That means the people that are left behind, including rival factions, start trying to you know, jockey for position and power. Right? So one of the things that happens as a result of this, B talks about this, is there is a Romano British chieftain whose name is Vortigern. He lives in what's called East Anglia, which, if you look at a map of England, you know, the side comes out here and there's this big bump, and then you come out and it comes over here, Cornwall, Wales, etc. Well, this big bump over here is part of what's called East Anglia, okay? Vortigern was in that area, the northern part of Gaul, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> and Vortigern's having problems. Why? Because if you look at that map, you're actually going to up like this and go up into Scotland. In second century, I believe, a Roman emperor named Hadrian built a wall. Trump wasn't the first man came up with the idea for a wall. He built a wall. For what purpose? To keep the people down here in? No. To keep the people up here out. Right? These were the pits and scots. How many of you have seen Mel Gibson's film Braveheart? Okay. What do the Scots do in Braveheart before they fight Edward Longshanks? Anybody remember? What kind of makeup do they put on? They paint themselves in blue. It's entirely anachronistic. The, the Scots of the 12th, 13th century did not do that, right? The pit, in fact, from written accounts we have describing the pit, they not only painted themselves in blue, they fought totally naked. And they would come out with these big old shields made out of oxide and stuff, and they would bang them with their swords or spears so that they resonated like a bass drum. And they come out of the misty woods, screaming bloody murder, stark naked, coming across as stark raving men. Kind of gave, you know, the other side the heebie jeans okay? So, Hadrian builds this wall to keep them out. He can visit this wall today. And this isn't just, you know, like this wall. This wall at points is 15, 20 feet wide. At points, it's as wide as this room. Because there are houses built into it underneath it. Right? And it's, it's a big, massive wall. The legions leave, and the Picts and Scots start raiding south. That's why Vortigern, the reason he's important, is he sends emissaries to northern Germany over here, over here on the continent. Because if there's one thing everybody in this time period knows about the Germans is they are great mercenaries. You pay them enough and they'll fight your battles and they'll do a very good job. See, the, the Romans, when they got up to the German homeland, let's say, they couldn't defeat the Germans. There's a famous battle in, I'm not going to get the date because I don't remember called the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, where the Roman legions fought against the Germans and the Germans defeated them. And Rome said, okay, uh, tell you what, we'll 
pay you to be nice to us. Tribute, right? And they're still making discoveries from that battle, archaeological discoveries. Keep that in mind. So, Vortigern sends emissaries over to these Germanic tribes. He says, we need help. We'll pay you. So, in around, we don't know the exact date, 449, 450, you have what I'm still going to call the Germanic invasion. <clears throat> These are also called by some the Germanic migrations. What's the difference between a migration and an invasion? Yeah. These are here to take over. These are here because they like, they like the lay of the land. They, they like what you have. These are going to take what you have and take your land. Right? So, according to Bede, this is just about all of the, everything I've said comes from Bede. Right? In his Ecclesiastical History of the English Speaking People. According to Bede, in 449, 450, these Germanic invasions begin. And these Germanic invasions are comprised of the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And you have, I think you do in the front of the book, you have in your book, in the back, I believe, Um, so let me just read the map. You have in the back of your that's not even gonna work there because it's too big. I've got a nope, different map. I'll post the map. You you have in modern day England, or you have these three tribes, right, or groups of people. They settled different parts of the Isle of Britain, right? We'll start with the Jews, because they're the smallest group, and they settled the smallest piece of property. If, if, if you're familiar at all with the map of England, over here, this should be... Sticking out more kind of like that, right? You have over here... Canterbury. It's the town, okay? But all of this was essentially called Kent, and it came from what the Kent is the name, okay? This is the area of the Jutes itself. We don't know why. We don't know why that's the only area, but that's the only area they settled, right? This area, okay, and this area, is essentially the area that the Saxons settled. So this is the South Saxon area, sorry. This over here is the West Saxon area. This over here is the South Saxon area. And this is the This is the East. Saxon area, right? Those get shortened to Wessex, six from Sax, Sussex, and modern day Essex, which is the area just east of London to the Minnesota coast. 
South uh, Sussex is where uh, Hastings, where the Battle of Hastings was fought, and where Surrey is, things like that. Wessex is where Winchester is, one of the first kingdoms, which is where Alfred reigned, etc. Right? Then you have this big area up here. Right? Well, this part I already told you was called East Anglia. All of this area, excluding Wales and those areas, excluding Wales, was essentially Anglia. East Anglia is where the East Anglians settled. They were only called the East Anglians because they settled in the eastern part. Okay? This is still today called East Anglia. There's a university called the University of East Anglia. And notice that name goes back 1500 years, roughly. Okay. In a little bit later, in the Old English period, this is going to be called Mercia. Okay. This part still here will still be called East Anglia. Mercia is related to the word marsh or mark, and, and both of those imply kind of borderland. It's kind of the borderland between, in that later period, this part down here, and what's up north, and what's to the west, okay? So, 449, 450, the Anglo-Saxon invasions begin. And it takes them roughly about 100 years to take control. All right? No single king is ruling. Bunch of little chieftains, right? Little kingdoms and such. And then, 597. And this is in a, a handout that I put on the, um, and a lot more information. A lot more dates and little brief things about these. Um, or in that handout that I put on the B2O website under the content tab. In 597, Pope Gregory the Great sends a Catholic missionary to Britain. Why does he send a Catholic missionary to Britain? Well, when he was a, still, I believe, a deacon. It was, I don't think it was when he was Pope. I could be wrong. Though. He was visiting the slave market in Rome. Okay? And he meets his two children. Beautiful little children. Blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, perfect Aryan kind of an idea. And he speaks to them, I'm assuming through an interpreter, translator. And they tell him that they are Angles from Angeland. Okay? Which is what becomes England. And he asks them about Jesus, and they don't know anything about Jesus. And he's like, this is such a shame. Because you're not angles, you are angels, angelus, which means messengers. And the message they brought to him is the message that these people need to be saved because they don't know Jesus, right? Why don't they know Jesus? Well, because the Anglo-Saxon Jews are good, pagan Germans. Thor, Odin, Freya, Freya, the whole nine yards. Think, think the stupid Marvel movies in reality, you know. They're worshipping those Germanic pagan deities. Why? Because way up here in Germany and modern-day Scandinavian stuff, Christianity hasn't reached. Christianity reached this place, Isle of Britain, probably by the end of the first century. And if you accept some mythic things, you know, Joseph of Arimathea brought the Holy Grail, all well, that kind of stuff. Do with that what you want. There's a lot of tradition that says Joseph of Arimathea, who is mentioned in the Gospels, did actually go to England. The whole Grail parts, you know, added on a lot, lot later. But we do know there's Christianity definitely by the middle of the second century. How do we know? Um... Well, you can go to the British Museum and you can see mosaics 
that have the Cairo monogram, okay, for the first two letters of Christ. And you can see other mosaics with just replete with Christian symbolism. And because we have the history of people being murdered for their faith by the Romans, right? So, why in 597, what, what happened to the Christians? That's what happened to the Christians. See, when the Anglo-Saxons and Jews came in, two, way of look, two ways of looking at it. Either the people that were there were assimilated. If you're a Star Trek fan, think the Borg, you know. They were assimilated into the Germanic culture, or they fled, or they fought and died. Okay? I mentioned over here this area, modern day Isle of Britain. This is today called Wales. If you're not a native of that area, if you're a native of that area, it's called pretty sure I always get this thing wrong. Cymru. It's either Cymru or Cymru. 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 And if you're a member of the people who live there, then you're either Cymru or Cymru. Like one name's the place, the other name's the people, and I can never remember which one is which. Okay? So where does this come from? Those are totally different. This derives from an old English word, Wales, which means foreign, exile. And it can also mean slave. You understand why somebody who is modern day Welsh would not call themselves a Welsh person? Because what does that mean? You're a slave, you're a foreigner, you're an exile in your own land. The Welsh and the Brits today still. Don't like the Brits. The Scots don't like the Brits. When you know England got to the Euro, man, the Scots for international football. The Scots were cheering the Germans. There was no great love for the Germans either. Now, World War II, oh. but they hate the Brits even more. Why? Because that hatred grows back. Fifteen hundred years, right? So he sends a Christian missionary by the name of Augustine, who brings Roman Christianity, right? Catholic Christianity. Within a hundred years, Britain, the Isle of Britain, is fairly thoroughly Christianized. I mean, yeah, there are still some holdouts. There are still some some pockets of pagan resistance, if you if you want to think of it that way. Um, but it, for the most part, it is fairly Christian. And we began to see as early as 680, or right thereabouts, Christian poetry being written. Okay? And that's Cadman, who we'll talk about in a couple of days. So for Wednesday, read the material from Bede that's on your syllabus, 44, what did I say, 44 to 56. Let me make sure that's right. <clears throat> and you've got pictures. 44, 56. Yes, 44 through 56. That includes Kesman's hymn. It includes the coming of the English. It includes the section on Abbas Hill, okay? Um, I've got two days set aside to cover that material and the story of Cat. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get a little bit ahead on Friday, maybe start some of the Wanderer. We'll just uh, wait and see. But pay special attention when you read that material. To that whole chapter about Abbas Hill, right? Because a lot of people say, oh, women didn't have any power. She was about the most powerful woman in Anglo Saxon England because of her role as ruler of the double monastery of Wermouth in Europe. Okay? Um, in the section on Cadman, because Cadman is the first named English poet. And it 
pretty important and pretty cool story um, that he tells us. Also, you don't have to pay as much in, um, emphasis on it, but the life and conversion of Edwin, king of Northumbria. Because right? that's pretty important too. All right, if there aren't any questions, we'll stop there.